A lot of the things that can be done, maybe are not being done today, but can be done moving forward, and to share that with each other. Um, and that's really the coolest part about this, because when we withhold such information, who are we benefiting? Who are we doing well for? And really what we're doing is we're harming ourselves, we're harming patients, we're harming families, we're harming everybody that comes into our front door. Um, so this is just really awesome. And I just thank you all for having me uh, here today. Uh, hopefully I don't disappoint here for the next uh, 20 something minutes, but I uh, wanna talk about a couple of things. Number one, how we define patient experience uh, at the Cleveland Clinic. What does it actually mean to us? Uh, how do we go about measuring it? Um, not only at the Cleveland Clinic, but across the United States. There are a lot of mandates from our federal government to participation in patient experience domains, and we're finding them having equal weighting in reimbursement models with things such as outcomes, uh, mortality rates, uh, accessibility, things like that. So they're only elevating, the focus on this stuff is only elevating um, across the United States and here obviously across Canada as well. We've seen similar things in the Middle East from some of our partners that have come over and talking about this. This is truly becoming a worldwide thing. So it's really, uh, really exciting to be here talking about it um, to another group of people. Uh, sorry, got a little happy there. Um, examples of some of the data, how we look at data, some of the things that we find impact the data. Um, a lot of you have mentioned this earlier, and there's one point that I do want to uh, uh, really quickly discuss, is having accessibility to all the data at your fingertips. If you simply administer a randomized, non-identifiable survey, uh, and only reported at the hospital level, at the highest of levels. Uh, Lena, I think you were talking about this earlier today. You're not learning anything from it, and you're not able to uh, give skills, uh, uh, tips, uh, uh, tricks back to the clinicians that are providing the care for elevating the experience across the board. And another point that was brought up that I truly cannot agree with more is we're going to hear a lot about communication in this. And communication is very much a two-way street. So it becomes very difficult to communicate with patients and take care with patients if we don't communicate with each other and take care with each other as well. There are very strong, solid links with all of that that unfortunately I can't tell. Those would be another two-hour long presentation and we don't have that kind of time today. Um, and then last, which is I think the most exciting part of any of this, is take some questions, have a discussion about some of the things here, some of the challenges you face, because I promise you, uh, if we're not facing them today, <clears throat> we have faced them in the past. And while we have gotten some things right over the 11 years that we've been doing this, we've also fallen flat on our face a few times as well. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty candid when it comes to that kind of stuff, so please feel free to ask any questions as we get to them. I want to start off with a quote, and this is from one of our institute chairmen. Um, we frequently have to go into things called quarterly reviews. We'll talk about that a little bit later and how we drive local accountability. But this guy just blew my mind uh, when we st first started down this road. Uh, he said, patient experience is much like doing the dishes. If you do the dishes every day after every meal, it takes a little bit of time, a little bit of effort. After 15 minutes, you're carrying on with your day. If you do patient experience once a month, once every four years, as I hear about, you're spending a lot of time uh, washing those dishes, scraping crust off the plates, yelling at people that are trying, your family that's trying to talk to you while you're cleaning up this giant mess in the kitchen. You're spending an inordinate, um, inordinate amount of time doing that stuff. Um, so it's just a quick, quick quote that I always found very relevant to the work that we do because this is truly an everyday type thing. And truthfully, whether you're measuring it or not, you're already doing these things. You're already communicating with patients. You're already responding to call lights when they go off. All of this stuff is already happening. So let's figure out what drives it and what, where patients tell us our biggest opportunities are, right? Right. Um, so one of the things that really, I think, elevated this for the Cleveland Clinic was that patients were saying that this is important to them. 40% of patients uh, involved in a 2008, uh, sorry, 2007 study from the McKinsey Consulting Company were mentioning that patient experience was at the forefront of reasons why they go to the hospitals and see the providers that they do. Now there's plenty of arguments to that. If you only have one hospital in a 400 mile radius, you don't have much of a choice. But in the patient populations that were being interviewed in this, they said this was important. So when we talk about are they patients, are they clients, are they customers, are they consumers, are they people, they're all of it. They're every single part of it, and they're saying that this is important to them. So why is it important? Number one, it's the right thing to do. Our CEO, Dr. Cosgrove, typically talks about this in any question that he's asked about regarding patient experience. It is the right thing to do to provide a positive experience. 
Now, does that mean catering to every demand that comes across, over-medicating, over-prescribing? Sorry about that. I get a little <laughs> handy uh, as I start speaking as well. No, of course not. But it is a measure of quality to patients. Pa most patients, John Q. Public, and I feel comfortable saying this because a couple of months ago, I became a patient in this huge continuum of healthcare that we have. This is quality to patients. I never once looked up the hospital acquired infections of the provider that I had to go see. I never once looked up their 30 day readmission rates for chronic heart failure patients. I never once looked into their surgical skill or where did they go to medical school and how long and who was their main instructor. I assumed all of that to be true. So all that I had to operate on and all that a lot of our patients have to operate on are these communication uh, instances, are our responsiveness uh, to them when they have needs, be it for the call button for pain medication or for water that's out of reach or because they threw the television remote across the room when Uncle Frank came in and now they want it back because Uncle Frank's gone. All of this stuff is very relevant uh, to the patient populations that we see. Transparency is a big one. In the United States, third-party vendors host websites that allow and invite patients to come and leave feedback on individual providers and individual hospitals. And guess what? There's no confirmation that you were ever a patient in said hospital or with said provider. You could be going on your neighbor Alice's experience and leaving a detailed, thorough review about how awful or how great these providers were. They typically had a negative slant in a lot of the third party sites. So uh, what we're seeing is a lot of healthcare organizations, and you can go on our clevelandclinic.org website today and look up individual providers. We are putting patient comments in their profiles about their care, good, bad, and ugly. As long as there's no uh, patient health uh, uh, PHI um, uh, in there, we don't want to uh, uh, violate any of the privacy uh, things that we're held accountable to. Or as long as there's nothing that's overwhelmingly derogatory, we have some stuff like that. But provided the comments are simply about interactions with the provider or with the provider team, they're up there. And the overwhelming majority of them are very positive, which is why it's inc incredibly frustrating when somebody comes up and says, I was just told my patients hate me. No, they don't. Whether you're in the first percentile or the 99th, you wouldn't be in the business you are if your patients hate you or hate your services. That doesn't mean we don't have opportunities to improve, though. Uh, engagement and outcomes, a lot has been spoken about that. I'm going to show you a couple of different uh, slides around some of the more outcome-centered data and the differences in these between patient populations. And then finally, risk. In the United States, there's a lot of financial risk being tied to patient experience data in the form of federal reimbursement for the patient populations that you might see, which to a place like the Cleveland Clinic equates to somewhere between 25 and $35 million a year. So an area of care affordability uh, that we happen to be in in the United States trying to reduce costs, improve efficiency, improve quality, this is an important metric that we must stay ahead of. <clears throat> I've heard this going back and forth a lot, and this is certainly not meant to judge anybody or anybody's perception on this. But at the Cleveland Clinic, we recognize patient experience and satisfaction as two different things. Satisfaction is an aspect of patient experience, but it is not the whole thing. It is not telling them, oh, you look lovely today and everything's going to be great and everything's going to be wonderful. Here's money for Starbucks. Go on down and get yourself a coffee. You know, that's going to improve satisfaction. Uh, but the really parts about experience are tied to a lot of different things. And when we talk about patient experience, it's about providing safe care. It's about providing high quality care. It's about patient satisfaction when it comes down to it. Look, do you need to be nice to people that you're serving, to people that you're interacting with? Yeah, you probably should be. And that has a lot to do with the satisfaction, at least the idea of satisfaction from our clinician audience. Well, just be nice, just be nice. Sure, you have to be a nice, but that's the low-hanging fruit. There are much deeper issues here that are both uh, operational, process-related, and much less individually related. Um, so for us, patient experience is, are these three things and never deviating from them. So how do we measure the experience? So here's a picture of my boss and I that our arts and photography uh, department took uh, a couple months back. And really, I think this is a lot of uh, where a lot of us are at, um, no matter how long you've been down this journey. We're always looking for more data, more data, more data. We need more surveys. We've got to do a different survey. We need another survey. We need a rounding survey, a daily survey, a morning survey. And then we've got to do phone calls. Then we've got to get H caps. Then we've got to check our ombudsman complaints and grievances. I wish I was making this stuff up. I'm not. 
We have, in Cleveland, we have all of the data we could ever care or want to have. What we need to do is begin connecting all of the dots to tell a more clinically relevant story that resonates with the very people taking care of our patients. So to your point from earlier today, it's about having that identifier somewhere in your raw data feeds either with a vendor or internally. That's about as nerdy as I'm going to get to, uh, about this, raw data feeds. I'm going to try not to be worse than that. <clears throat> Uh, across the United States, we survey the co entire continuum of our healthcare services. It all started with our hospital or HCAPS inpatient survey. I know we've thrown this word out a little bit. How many of you are familiar with HCAPS? <laughs> all right, preaching to the choir here, which can make things easier and also more difficult depending on what I happen to say moving forward. But um, this is a combination of 35 questions that are broken down into 11 domains or composite items that are publicly reported across the country every three months, four times a year. These data are publicly reported for 4,600 United States hospitals. So we have an incredible comparative database right there. Every single quarter, we download the data. We draw our percentile rankings from 1 to 99 for all of these composites, and we figure out where we stand and who needs to be yelled at. <laughs> Kidding, of course. But you can see that this has now begun to encompass the entire continuum. We've gone from the hospital to the home health setting. Uh, we now have health insurance, in center hemodialysis, nursing home, medical practice, which is now called CG CAPS, clinician and group ca uh, CAPS. It's for your office visit, uh, primary care type visits with your pr uh, providers. Hospice CAPS, ambulatory surgery CAPS are coming in 2017. Uh, ED CAPS and hospital PEDS are coming somewhere down the line further. So it is important that we take the things that we have learned from HCAPs and apply them to these other settings before they come out to get people in front of these metrics so we don't have a situation like we did at the Cleveland Clinic when HCAPs were released in 2008, we were in the 10th percentile. That did not mean top 10. I know I'm again preaching to the choir, but some people happen to think that that was the case. Uh, we are in the bottom 10% of all United States hospitals. Today we are upwards of the 80th percentile in just about every domain except for quiet at night. We're still really, really, really poor at quiet at night. But why do we need to be quiet at night? It's a hospital. I'm kidding, of course, again. It is important that people can relax in the hospital. It is an area where we have work to do. Um, and it is also the lowest performing one uh, across the country. So I'm really trying to make myself feel better about that uh, by saying that. The key to these metrics, and we've, we've heard this word a couple of times, but one of the reasons that why we've been move forward and have some improvement over time is because we have local accountability. We report the data out to our nursing units based off of the discharging nursing unit that a patient comes from. Of course, they could have been in 12 units before that. Um, and we don't know. We only have the discharge unit on there. So it's not always about that single unit or single nurse or single nurse manager. It's really much more about the collaboration, the consistency across all these care teams. Uh, we have quarterly executive reviews and the APR process, which is the annual professional review. Every single provider at the Cleveland Clinic is on a one-year contract. They have meetings with our chief of staff throughout the year, and they go through a whole laundry list of metrics to figure out whether or not your contract is going to be renewed or if you would be a better fit at another health system. There have been many instances of individuals who have been politely suggested to that they might be better somewhere else because of metrics related to patient experience. Not just a single HCAP score, but in concert with other metrics that they have available, where are you falling amongst your peers? Where have we told you to improve over the last year and what did you actually do about it? This stuff happens and happens thankfully not as frequently as it did 10 years ago, but uh, it still happens uh, as sometimes. Uh, the quarterly executive review process is where all of our institute chairmen go in and meet with Dr. Cosgrove and go over a shorter but similar list to figure out where are you performing, where do you need to improve. These are not celebratory meetings. Uh, we are very much in an era of continuous improvement where even if you're at the bar, we're going to move the bar on you. So it's always happening, it's continuous, it's cyclical, it's whatever word uh, you want to use to describe it. But those are coming out of our quarterly reviews to keep a lot of these metrics fresh. Patient experience is one of four along with accessibility, um, patient safety, and quality. Uh, depending on what institute you're in and what patients you care, uh, care for, it dictates the measures that you are being held accountable to. We have monthly business reviews, which is just another little 
nuanced portion of the above quarterly executive reviews, kind of like mini meetings in a sense to see where are we today, what are patients saying, where can we improve, where are we inefficient. We have leadership rounding, which has eventually gone through to now nurse leader rounding, nurse manager rounding, mystery rounding, where a nurse manager from another floor goes and rounds on patients for a to completely different patient population. And really, there's nothing more valuable that you can begin to do today, aside from educating, than implement some sort of rounding initiative with your team. You cannot manage or understand how patient experience goes off a single number alone from your desk behind a computer screen. You need to be out there and seeing it for yourself to be able to do it. And what we find in the inpatient world is consistent nurse rounding leads you to the 90th percentile across the board at our organization, statistically significant with all nursing units across the board. And then when that answer to the hourly rounding question begins to fall, our scores plummet. And what is the most correlated to nurse communication or doctor communication? They're interchangeable. And in the hospital, it's because the nurse is front and center. When a question happens, the nurse is the one that's spending 23 hours and 50 minutes with that patient, in front of that patient. So as you're going to see here in a future slide, it's not just how nurses communicate and how doctors communicate to patients, but how do nurses and doctors communicate together to deliver this consistent message again? Um, and one of the best ways to do that is through daily huddles with your team. These are happening all the time uh, at our organization. Thanks. So measuring the experience, number one, we all know the data are inherently subjective. We've all heard that the data are not re representative of my population. We've all heard only angry patients return surveys, or today I actually heard only patients that have positive experience return surveys. And then my favorite is the quote that these patients are not qualified to judge my skill. Well, that's not what they're doing. Our Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality says that we pick measures that are important to patients through 13 years of dry tests and interviews. So they generally focus around around communication. And as you can see here, uh, the communication uh, is very important. Actually, you might not be able to see this because this is an ugly matrix CMS points out. Uh, but our overall hospital rating and recommendation of the hospital are most highly correlated with nurse communication. Nurse communication is typically most highly correlated with doctor communication. And then you see a lot of variability, depending on which hospital you're looking at and what their patient populations have to be. So. How do we analyze the experience? I hate iceberg pictures, and I hate when they're used as metaphors for something. So here's an iceberg picture uh, as a metaphor for how we analyze patient feedback. And the top is really your score. That's the score. That's what you're looking into. That's what you're being held accountable for. Everything below the surface is what actually drives that score. And in our worlds, uh, how patients rate and describe their experience, their interactions, their communication can be dependent on their acuity, the severity of why they're here, the length of time why they're here, how did they enter our organization, was it planned or unplanned, uh, how many different consultative services are, are necessary uh, in managing this uh, individual encounter. And all of this stuff has an effect. I don't know why this graphic is showing up so funky, but what you're seeing here, the green line is our national 90th percentile, the yellow is our national 50th, and what you see is a very consistent uh, trend, downward trend, of patient experience related to communication as their length of stay goes up. Because you're, you're just having, adding more data points for this consistency to fall. However, when you get past day eight, you start to see scores climb back up again. Anyone have any idea why that is? It's because a relationship has begun to be made with patients. Those are typically in our uh, oncology type units, our transplant floors. It's not patient-centered care, it's not provider-centered care, it's relationship-centered care. Where we're all in the middle, we're all on the outside, and we're all working together to keep the communication consistent and keep the experience positive. Similar to length of stay, severity of illness comes in, the sicker you are, the more likely you're here longer, the more likely you have many different services involved, and the lower experience score. This isn't because people here with a severity of illness of four are just mean people that don't like to talk to patients. That's silly to think that. But until you begin to look at the data and understand how the data shape up, it's very easy to assume that that's the case. Uh, service line is another good one. We must mean all of our medical patients uh, are just unhappy, angry people, and the people that take care of them are mean and don't explain things, right? No, again, that's silly. 
because as you see on the next slide, most of our medical patients are coming in through the ED or a hospital transfer, meaning they did not plan to be in our hospital. They have a different level of anxiety, they have a different set of concerns, they have different opportunities to further their experience or enhance their experience than a surgical patient might do, who now has a planned admission, a planned surgery, knows when they're going home, of course, I'm speaking in generalizations, none of this happens 100% of the time, but usually the care path does not deviate from one patient to the next. We know how this stay is going to go and who's going to be involved versus those that did not expect to be here. So when we look about, okay, great, communication is important, 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 but what about communication is important? Number one, you need to figure out where are the behavioral issues, where, are, where is Dr. Dan being rude, where is Dr with his care teams, and then you begin to see what the real issues are. They're around the coordination of care, the plan of care. How often is that delivered consistently? Because our mark is always. That's it. When patients have an option to respond, always is the mark we're after. Usually, sometimes, the nevers are all the same in the eyes of our federal government. So always is what we're after, consistency is what we're after, and it can be accomplished through multi multidisciplinary rounding and huddles, such as a bedside shift report on, on the inpatient side. I got to experience that for five days in August, and I thought it was the coolest thing in the world to sit there and watch one nurse coming on who has no idea who I am, and in 30 seconds, a relationship has already been established because I had one from the prior 12 hours with the nurse that was taking care of me. She just relayed all of that information to the new nurse and we're already in a good spot. I feel like I know this person and, and uh, he or she knows me. So that relationship has already begun to build uh, right there within 20 seconds of the new nurse coming on board. It's not a long meeting, it's not a long conversation, but it's enough to get the facts across and it helps. So how do we know it helps? It's because the patients tell us. On the surveys itself, we have numbers, we have all of the quantitative information we have, and the valuable info is in the patient comments. If you can do one thing today, it would be share the comments with frontline caregivers at your organization. Let them read them, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Because when 20 patients who do not know each other and have no mutual benefit to say the same thing, say the same thing, it's that opportunity that we're all after as we continue to move this needle in the world of patient experience. So we, somebody mentioned it before, there's no real easy button for this. It's a lot of manual work and they're absolutely right. You get all of this unstructured data in the form of patient comments and now you need to categorize them. Now you need to drive them to relevant themes so you can begin to quantify them. So all of a sudden we've taken the qualitative and tried to make it quantitative once again. Um, but it is really uh, impactful for the staff that are taking care because what we can see, uh, this, this format's really off. What we see our high volume of patient comments are after categorizing these in involve the plan of care, involve the coordination of the team and delivering that consistent message. Very little is this about Dr. Dan's mean to everybody, and yet that is what the idea is when you first introduce this to your staff, to the people taking care of patients. At least that was our experience, was that it automatically meant they think we're mean, they think we're unqualified, no one's gonna give us an always. Gotta stop hitting that. Uh, but you see the behavioral issues become second and third on the list. It's not what patients are telling, they're not just telling us to be nice, they're telling us we have a real opportunity to elevate their experience and their quality of care by keeping things consistent and explaining that to them in a way that they can understand. Meeting them in the middle and furthering that relationship. And then at the end of the day, you can begin to link those comments up to the actual scores that they give. If I'm after improving uh, doctor communication, I want to know who didn't give me an always and what did they say? And how often were those themes the same thing? I mean, at, at, a, at a certain point, it's not rocket science. They've given us all the information that we have. We just need to do more with it. And at the Cleveland Clinic, we need to continue to do more, more with it, just like I'm sure all of us do. No matter how well you're doing today, there's an opportunity to do better. Use all of the information that's at your disposal and move forward. So just very quickly, in summary, this is a little bit of a soapbox comment right here. It is more than just making people happy. It is more than just making them satisfied. It is important and it's accessible to patients and they are looking it up more and more, especially in the United States. I can't say the same about here because I don't know, but I imagine just by the sheer volume of people we have in the room, it is no different whatsoever.
Uh, survey and data are valid when they're used properly. If you're trying to pull daily scores, you are making a mistake and doing a disservice to your patients and your staff. You are demotivating the care that they, uh, for, from the care that they provide. Look at comments every single day, but a number is just a number, and over a much longer period of time, a very clear pattern emerges. So use the data properly. Don't try to make it say things that it doesn't. Uh, use the scores to identify your focus area. Use the comments to understand why the scores are the way they are. <clears throat> and then finally, move forward. When you implement a project, an initiative to improve patient experience, I tell nurse managers, I tell physician leaders, you're not allowed to look at your scores for six to nine months. We've used the data to educate ourselves on what the issue is from a big population of people. You have now taken that issue to your staff, which knows better than anybody how we can fix the issue. Now just move forward and focus on that. The scores will follow. Oftentimes they drop the first month of an improvement initiative, right? We've seen that before. The effect, what the name of it is, actually escapes me right now. But we know that that can be true. So you can be abandoning great initiatives that have a tremendous impact on a patient's experience solely because you looked at the data too early or before it had enough time to mature and now you've scrapped that potentially world-changing initiative that you put into place. And just one more time because I just think it's so cool and so important and so easy. The bedside shift report on the inpatient side, the rounding from your nursing staff, from your physician teams, from your leadership teams will have a positive impact and it is a very minimal investment in your leadership teams to go ahead and do that. So that's it for me. Uh, thank you very much. Take a couple of questions if anybody has any. Yes. So I 